and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for March 2023. This month is a month of close planetary encounters. I'll take you through where and when to spot each of them. We'll also take a look at the Aristarchus crater on the moon, the constellation of Gemini and how to find the star cluster known as M35. Let's start by taking a look at those planetary conjunctions. My solar system challenge for you this month is to see how many of these encounters you can spot. There are opportunities to see Venus and Jupiter, Mercury and Saturn, Mercury and Jupiter and Venus and Uranus all appearing close to each other in the night sky. The first of these occurs on the 1st of March. As I briefly mentioned to you last month, Venus and Jupiter will appear close enough to each other that you should be able to comfortably fit them into the field of view of a pair of binoculars if you have them. If we take a look at around 7 o'clock, so not long after sunset, you can see that Venus and Jupiter are together here in the west. If we take a look at each of them individually, go to Venus first you should be able to see that if you have a small telescope available to you, that Venus is showing a gibbous phase. If you go to Jupiter with a small telescope, you might be able to make out the north and south equatorial cloud belts, and you should be able to see that all four of Jupiter's Galilean moons will be showing. If I place a binocular view, you should see that they both fit comfortably into the field of view here. This is, example is a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars and you'll notice that Venus is the brighter of the two and you might be able to catch a hint of Jupiter's moons there as well. If you have a small telescope available and a, a low powered eyepiece you might still be able to fit them into the field of view of your low powered eyepiece so getting in a little bit closer than you would with a pair of binoculars but still experiencing both planets together. If we follow these two over the course of the next few days, you can see that they gradually separate over time. So if you don't get a chance on the first, then there will still be opportunities to see these two in the same part of the sky over the following days. Moving on to our next close encounter, this time it's Mercury and Saturn, and their closest approach will be on the morning of the second and that will be just before the sun rises. So I'm gonna to go to around 6.45, and I'm just gonna move around to the east. And you can see that the sky is brightening here, getting ready for the sunrise. I'm just gonna zoom in around here, and you can see that we have Saturn almost getting lost in that morning twilight. We haven't got Mercury yet, so I'm just gonna move on a few minutes. And there you can see Mercury just popping up. You need to make sure that if you want to see these two that you look before the sun rises. You don't want to risk damaging your eyesight. You don't want to risk accidentally looking at the sun. Um, if you're not confident in doing it, then there are other opportunities to see both of these two when the sky is much darker. You will need a very flat eastern horizon to be able to see them as well, because if there's anything obstructing your view, by the time they get high enough, the sun will also have risen and you won't be able to see them. The next conjunction I'd like to tell you about is between Jupiter and Mercury and occurs just after sunset on the 27th. So if I go to the 27th and we'll go to just before 8pm. And this time looking to the west, so you would like to have a nice clear western horizon. The one I've got here isn't great, but you can still see Jupiter and Mercury here. The thing to do for this one is to wait until the sun has set. Um, and once you're sure that it has, you can sweep around with a pair of binoculars until you find them. You can also check over the following few days to see them if you don't manage on the 27th. And they'll be a little bit further apart, but still fairly close together. And finally, the last one is on the 30th. And we are just after the sun sets again. And this time it's Venus and Uranus. For this one you can wait until it's a little bit darker. So you can see Venus is quite high here. And if you want to spot Uranus as well, then you want the sky to be as dark as possible because Uranus is very, very faint. So what you can do is go outside after the sun has set, have a look where Venus is, and then see how late you can wait before it gets too low. Um, 
and this is another one of those ones that's so close together that you can see them together in a pair of binoculars if you have them. Um, if you do that, you might be able to note that Uranus has a greenish hue, uh, hue to it, um, and it's be quite interesting to contrast that against Venus. I think for this you'll struggle if you don't have a telescope or a pair of binoculars just because Venus is bright, it's not too far from sunset and also Uranus is very faint and I think you'll have a hard time spotting it if you're just trying to do it with your naked eye. Let's move on to the moon now. This month the full moon occurs on the 7th of March so we'll go to the 7th. And your moon watch target from me this month is the Aristarchus crater. And that is the brightest crater on the moon. The way to spot it is to find the Tycho crater, which is probably probably the easiest crater to spot on the moon. And then you've got the Copernicus and Kepler craters over here. And if you sort of draw a line from Tycho through Copernicus and Kepler, you can find Aristarchus over here. So it as I said, it's the brightest crater on the moon, bright because it's so young, one of the youngest of all the craters on the moon at around 450 million years old, which is quite funny because we would consider that to be very old. But in astronomical terms and in terms of lunar craters, it's not. It's actually really young. If you watch over the course of the month, you can see how its appearance changes with the changing lunar phases. We often say that observing the moon at full moon isn't the best time because you don't get to see that interplay between light and shadow that you get to see at the other phases. It's really interesting to look at things when they're appearing near to the terminator. So if you manage to spot Aristarchus at any point during the month, it's worth going and revisiting it at a different time to see whether you feel that its appearance has changed. It was named for the Greek astronomer Aristarchus, who was the first to propose that the Earth rotates on its axis and orbits the Sun, which at the time was a really radical idea. Um, and of course, now we know that that is indeed what happens. But it was quite a long time before that was worked out mathematically and he was proven to be right. If we stay with the moon and I will take you through a couple of interesting things that you might like to spot alongside the moon this month. The first one is on the 22nd, just after sunset, and you have a really, really thin crescent moon. I've got some very unhelpful landscape um, on my view here. This is another one of those times when you want a nice, clear western horizon. Anytime you're looking for these things that appear just after sunset or just before sunrise, you want to try and find a, a nice spot with a clear horizon uh, and the planet Jupiter. Now, the 1% lit moon is really hard to spot at the best of times, so it's a real challenge to spot a crescent that's this thin, and if you do manage to spot it on the 22nd, then you also get the treat of seeing it with Jupiter as well. On the 24th, we have the similar thing, but this time the moon and Venus. We can go a little bit later for these two. The darker the sky is when you try to see these things, the better. And you can also see we've got Uranus here as well. So you've got the Moon, Venus and Uranus just after sunset on the 24th. And then on the 25th, you've got the Moon and the Pleiades star cluster. Um, again, a, a thin crescent moon, but getting thicker now alongside the Pleiades. If we go to the 28th, we have the Moon and Mars. Um, in our constellation of the month, which is Gemini, or very close to our constellation of the month of Gemini. This brings me nicely on to our constellation of the month, so I'll talk about that now. If I put the art on, you can see that Gemini is depicted as some twins. Um, so Gemini means the twins in Latin. It's familiar to most because it is a constellation of the zodiac, which is it means it's in the area of sky that includes the paths of the sun and planets. In Egyptian astrology, they were known as twin goats, in Arabian astrology as twin peacocks, and in Greek mythology as the twins of Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux are sometimes known as the patron saints of sailors, and they were said to rescue sailors who had been shipwrecked by the sea god Poseidon. If I take the art off now and just talk to you about how best to spot it. So these two, Castor and Pollux, are quite bright stars to be able to see. 
if you want to find them and you're not sure, then there's a way that you can do it using uh, the very familiar constellation of Orion. So if you can spot Orion in the night sky, then you can draw a line from the um, giant star, very bright star, Rigel, through the bright star Betelgeuse and all the way up to Castor and Pollux in Gemini. Your deep sky challenge for March is to see if you can spot the open star cluster M35 or Messier 35 and conveniently on the 29th it appears quite close to the planet Mars. So if you didn't have Mars to help you the way to spot this cluster is to draw uh, it's an, another star hopping activity for you so draw a line from Betelgeuse to Pollux and then along that line the brightest star that you see along that line is this one um, on the foot of Pollux and if you then draw a line from this one Alhina to Capella the brightest star in Auriga, which was the constellation of the month last month then you can find the cluster M35 along this line um, in this case, though, if you look on the 29th, if we just zoom in on Mars, you can see down here that we have the cluster M35, the Shubuckle cluster. And it has a magnitude of around 5.3, so it's really faint. You might be able to spot it with your naked eye if you are in a dark location. Better with a pair of binoculars if you have them. Uh, and it contains several hundred stars. It will look like a fuzzy patch in with your naked eye or with a pair of binoculars. And if you do have a small telescope, then you'll start to be able to resolve that there are um, individual stars in there. And you can see here why it's called the shoe buckle cluster, because um, it appears close to the shoe of Castor. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for March. I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month and I'll be back next month to talk about what you can see in April.